Hello, everybody. Today we'll be reading about life in the spirit and the future glory. Because we'll be reading through Romans chapter 8. Uh, but before we get to that, just a brief recap. Uh, so far in Romans, we've been talking about the struggle between, um, you know, I can do what I want because I'm covered by grace and trying to keep hold of the law. And the big thing yesterday was um, that the sin that we do doesn't need to be the thing that defines us. It shouldn't be the thing that defines us. Um, that's that whole section of like the sin. It's not me who sins, but the sin that's in me. Meaning like, at least my understanding of it is we do not have to be defined by our failures. We don't have to be defined by our sins, but it's by God who came down to earth and died on the cross for us. Um, and that's kind of where we are. So I invite you to grab your Bibles, open up to Romans chapter eight. I'm reading out of the new living translation. If you don't have a physical Bible, I'd love to hook you up with one. Um, or you can go to biblegateway.com or open up your Bible app. I'm reading out of the new living translation, Romans chapter eight. And if you're wondering where I am and well, my lid and the coffee cup got wrecked a little bit. Um, but I'm in Menorah Park again. This is one of my favorite places to come and read. Um, well, I forgot my tripod, so I, I found uh, this nice little bench to to prop my phone up and why it's a vertical video today. Uh, but yeah, so without further ado, Romans chapter 8. Life in the Spirit. So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. The law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. So God did what the law could not do. He sent his own son in a body, like the body of like the bodies of we sinners have. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving us his son as a sacrifice for our sins. He did this so that the just requirement of law would be fully satisfied for us, who no longer follow our sinful natures, but instead follow the Spirit. Those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things. But those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. So letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death. But letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. For the sinful nature is always hostile to God. It never did obey God's laws, and it never will. That's why those who are still under control of their sinful nature can never please God. But you are not controlled by your sinful nature. You are controlled by the Spirit. If you have the Spirit of God living in you, and remember, and remember that those who do not have the Spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to him at all. And Christ lives within you. So even though your body will die because of sin, the Spirit gives you life because you have been made right with God. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by the same Spirit living within you. Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. For if you live by its uh, decrees, you will die. But if through the power of the Spirit you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. 
So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba, Father. For the spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. And since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. But if we are to share his glory, we must also share his suffering. The future glory, verse 18. Uh, Hey, Ryan, welcome. Uh, We're in Romans 8. So continuing verse 18. Yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. For all creation is waiting eagerly for that future day when God will reveal who his children really are against its will all creation will subject will be was subject i'm going to read that again against its will all creation was subjected to god's curse but with eager hope the creation looks forward to the day when it will join god's children in glorious freedom from death and decay For we know that all creation has been groaning as the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. And we believe, we believers also groan, even though we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste of future glory. For we long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering. We too wait with eager hope for the day when God will give us our full rights as his adopted children, including the new bodies he has promised us. We were given this hope when we were saved. If we already have something, we don't need hope for it. But if we look forward to something we don't yet have, we must wait patiently and confidently. And the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, We don't know what God wants us to pray for, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groans that cannot be expressed in words. And the Father who knows all hearts knows what the Spirit is saying, for the Spirit pleads for us believers in harmony with God's own will. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. For God knew his people in advance and chose them to become like his sons so that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Having chosen them, he called them to come to him. Having called them, he gave them the right to stand with himself. And having given them the right standing, he gave them his glory. Nothing can separate us from God's love. Verse 31. What shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? Since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up as well, won't he also give us everything else? Who dares accuse us whom God has chosen for his own? No one, no one. For God himself has given us right standing with himself. Who then will condemn us? No one. For Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us. And he is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand, pleading for us. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger, threatened with death? As the scriptures say, for your sake... We are killed every day. We are being slaughtered like sheep. No, despite all these things, all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today, nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky or in the earth below 
Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. May God add a blessing to the reading of Romans 8. So now, yeah, we're doubling down on just that God's love. We are not saved by works. It's not how good we are, how good we are at this, that, or the other. It's doubling down on us being saved through faith, through what Jesus did on the cross. But with that too, there's still a couple things that really stood out to me. Um, I really, really like the battle that is displayed in our minds, continuing from what we talked about yesterday as well. Um, like yesterday, seven, uh, in verse 7, starting at like verse 14, and that struggling with sin. That struggle kind of continues, and it's challenging us to change what we're focusing and spending our mind energy on, because that's going to lead to other things. When we start thinking about things, we start obsessing about some things, that leads us down the line to do do either bad or really good things. Are we concentrated on love and forgiveness? Are we concentrated on, you know, this bad thing happening, that bad thing happening? An example, when we got here today, I had a bunch of things going wrong, just kind of dropped everything. Um, My coffee cup not only was leaking, but I also had an ice cap with me and I went to go put it down on the table and it just all fell apart and I was in a bad mood. I could have stayed focused on that. Um, but I have my wife with me who just prayed and be like, let's just let that all go. Just let that all go. And he's like, yeah, if I'm just fixated on doing the checklist of everything bad that's going on. That's something that leads to death. It leads to depression. It leads to sadness, it leads to anger, which then overflows onto the other people that I interact with today. Um, and it would overflow into this uh, Bible study as well. Just kind of my mood being down low. So I really like what it says in verse six. So letting your sinful nature control your minds leads to death. When we let those little inconveniences pile up or when we just get fixated on how someone wronged us, it leads to death. But letting the spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. So when we focus on forgiveness and the things that the Holy Spirit teaches us, like when we focus on the fruits of the spirit within our own lives, uh, love, joy, patience, self-control i'm drawing a blank on all of them but look up the fruits of the spirit if you want to know what i'm talking about because i'm forgetting a bunch um you know like if we focus on those types of things our mind will be a lot freer and when we put ourselves into those things and we start thinking about those things um with those that we're in community with whether it's our enemies or our friends our family those are the things that are going to help, you know, be wells of positivity and joy and peace. Uh, this says life and peace for us. That doesn't mean, you know, you can't bring correction. You can't bring, you know, like, hey, this this is bad. This kind of hurt. Let's work on this together. Like, you can call things out and speak truth to things. Like, hey, when you did this, this actually hurt. You know, it doesn't mean don't be honest because then that's a whole other ball of worms. But focus on, you know, how to make things right. Focus on those things that are part of the fruit of the spirit. Um, For the sinful nature is always hostile to God. It never did God's law. It never will. That's why those who are still under the control of their sinful nature can never please God. And when we, I read that, my mind went to, there's a lot of people that claim to be following God. There's a lot of people that we've read about in Ezekiel and Isaiah and like a ton of the Old Testament. Even in uh, the New Testament with Jesus and the Sadducees and the Pharisees, there's a lot of these people who are trying to follow God, yet they're actually just following their own sinful nature. They're following their own like, this is my power. This is something I want to hold on to. And they were refusing to listen to God. They were refusing to actually follow God's commands, yet they said that they were following. And they got put into positions of power and authority and for leading people to God, and they still weren't. They were following their own sinful nature still. 
they wandered away from the path and they stayed off and they refused to come back, which is a scary, scary thing. Those who were still under the control of their own sinful nature can never please God and they never will, which is a scary thought. And then that gets doubled down because uh, later on it says that um, the Spirit of God raised Jesus from the dead. I'm um, sorry. It talks about them being like revealed. Oh, yeah, 18. Yet we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory we will that we'll reveal later. Um, it talks about like those who truly follow God will be revealed. And it's like, hmm. so there's people that, you know, we might think are following God that really are just following their own selfishness, their own evil desires. It's just a scary thought. I hope I'm following God and I'm not following my own selfish desires. That's a tough thing. But you know what? I'm not necessarily the best judge for that. I need to be able to hear others because it's so easy to get lost in our own thing. So there's a lot of times where I'll ask questions like, hey, am I, do you guys feel like I, you know, I'm representing Jesus as well? Like, what are some issues? And I, like, I ask those questions a lot because if I keep myself being the judge of it, I know, you know, from my own sinful past that I can justify some pretty evil things. I have justified some pretty evil things that are not of God. So I rely on those that God has put me in community with to help keep me accountable for some of those things. Um, then uh, I love that. that So one of the other big things, and this is going to be my big final uh, point, is like we are the adoptive children of God. Um, while I was coming to know God, I heard all of this, that he can call me his own, and that he'll never kind of leave us, forsake us, that we are his adopted children. We can call him Abba Father. And I grew up without knowing my dad. Um, and I was like, parents love their kids, so he just loves me and doesn't want to be a part of my life. And one of the big hurdles that I had to get over in my walk with actually choosing to follow God was, is God just going to be the same? I make that jump over and then he's just going to leave. I got to the place where I was like, God is real. He wants me to follow him. But then when I follow him, is he just going to leave? And we read in this, that he is not going to leave. God is not going to leave. He loves us and he's going to be present. And I had to challenge him on that. That this whole last section, nothing can separate us from God's love. Uh, from my personal experience of being a Christian for nearly 20 years, it is absolutely true. He will not, nothing can separate us from God's love. Um, so I'm going to read from 35 to the end again. And think about your own life and think about you and God, you and Jesus, how none of these things are going to separate you from God's love. So verse 35, can anything separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity? Or are persecuted or are hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? As the scriptures say, for your sake, we are killed every day. We are being slaughtered like sheep. No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ Jesus who loved us. And I am convinced nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life. Neither angel nor demon. Neither our fears for today or our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Nothing can separate us from, our, from God's love. Nothing will lead God away from you. God is going to be present with you. When you make that decision to follow God, you are his adopted child. 
Christ is the firstborn, and we get adopted into that. We get grafted in. And he's never left me or forsaken me. Doesn't mean I haven't had troubles. Lord knows I've had troubles. I've had doubts. You know, I've struggled with this, that, and the other. And I have sinned, and I have sinned, and I have sinned. Yet God has never left me. He's never abandoned me. He calls me back to that path. And I follow. And then I wander off again because something shiny and that looks exciting is over here. And before I know it, I'm in the valley of the dead looking at dry bones. Um, But God always calls me back. He always walks with me back. And that's one of the reasons why I always pray, you know, at the end, like, help us to walk humbly with you. Because we need God to help us do that. So on that note, let us pray. AJC, awesome Jesus Christ. I thank you for the ways that you love us, that you will never leave us, that nothing can separate us from your love. And Lord, let us not follow bad leaders. Let us not follow leaders that really just have those selfish ambitions in their hearts and in their minds, but help us to follow you first and foremost, that we are in community and help us to stay focused on you and bring people into our lives that when we start following our own sinful, selfish ways, that they can point us back onto your path and that we can walk with you back onto your path. But I thank you so much, Lord, that no matter how far we walk and we wander away, we will not be separated from your love. So Lord, today we have a lot of friends in our community that are mourning. A lot of friends in our community that have trouble. A lot that are experiencing the stings of death, whose lives are in danger. Lord, help them to feel your presence, to feel your love, and let them know that you are near. Help us to do what is right. Help us to love mercy, especially mercy over our enemies and within our own families. Lord, help us to walk humbly with you, and we believe, Lord, but help us with our disbelief. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, thank you guys very much for joining me. Have a fantastic day. God bless. Bye.